Well, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. David Miller. Uh, I've known David for a very, very long time, a very, very, very long time, and uh, have been more privileged to work with him uh, as uh, an outstanding compounding pharmacist uh, for my tenure here in Grand Rapids. Uh, and he does this presentation for us every year in which he just uh, lays out some of the, uh, the benefits of uh, compounding, some of the techniques he uses, and uh, creates some innovative opportunities for us to help our patients. So uh, without uh, any further ado, I'll just turn it over to you, David. Thank you, John. Well, it's my pleasure to be here this morning, and I hope we can learn a lot. Uh, you get to learn everything that I've learned in 20 years in the next 57 minutes. Buckle in. Yeah. Uh, have you seen this? Anybody seen this uh, puzzle before? You've seen it? Okay. Who has, The other two haven't seen it? This is, in the room this is interactive. Okay, you've seen it. So how do you solve this puzzle? You want to go up and show us how you solve it? Um. Oh, do you want me to, to go up there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the folks on the screen won't see it, but, okay. but they know you'll be go, trying there. Go like this, this. Oh, no, that's not right. I don't know. Okay. I've done it before. Okay. It's been a while. I have seen but, it. But but you can't remember. You've seen it, right? A long time ago, but I don't remember. How okay. All right. So I'm going to go up. Sorry, people at home. You're going to get to see my um, bald head. I think so, it's something dying. So it, it's hard to solve this, right? Why is that? We can do this. Right? Yeah. So, okay. So, yeah, you go past. And so, yes. the reason that you couldn't solve the puzzle is because you imposed a box around that that doesn't exist except in your mind. And in treating hospice patients and palliative care patients, we got to get outside that box because what they taught you in med school doesn't apply to these people. Um, so here's a real life example I had 15 years ago or so. A 67 year old female, uh, 36 kilograms, terminal cancer in your end of life, severe pain, collapsing veins, uh, non oral. Good morning, Maya. Uh, severe muscle wasting, rectal fistula, extensive dermal lesions covering the entire body. How would you treat her pain? You have to treat her pain. Again, interactive. Y'all on the on the on the, on the on the Zoom can can chime in too. Not just those in this room here. Probably ketamine. Well, I love ketamine, but how are you going to get it in her? Uh, I mean, you can use nasal. I like nasal. Potentially do a topical. Um, you could, but she her dermal, her skin's breaking down. So that's not, you know, you couldn't use a fentanyl patch or something like that because of that. Is she breathing? Is your patient breathing? Yes. Yes. Okay. Might, might that be a, um, a, a delivery mechanism for drugs? Nebulized. Nebulized, exactly. Yeah. So I, I like ketamine, I like fentanyl, I like morphine, I like all that stuff. So nasal, um, inhaled, yeah, all, all those are great options. Another real life example, um, she was actually a trillium, a, a faith hospice patient, a four year old female gut shutting down, severe pain. Uh, she was on Lyrica, amitriptyline, uh, ibuprofen, morphine. How do we get those into her body? You got to treat her, docs. Little four-year-old girl in severe pain, um, but she can't take anything by mouth. How do we treat her? Are those, could you do like suppositories? That's exactly what we did. Yep. Suppository. So we, we, um, we need to think about unique ways to help our patients sometimes because they can't get the medication in the way the drug companies have designed them to get it. Um, is that a pretty little flower thing? 
but it's actually aspergillus. Um, so you have a patient with an aspergillus infection, a severe aspergillus sinus infection. Um, the only thing it's susceptible to is ampho B. So do you give your patient ampho B for a sinus infection? Yeah. You wouldn't? Not, not in the traditional form. How would you give it to them? Nasal spray? Yeah, exactly. Nasal spray or nasal irrigation solution. Exactly. So um, sometimes when we're looking at the hospice and palliative care patient too, we need to look at site-directed drug delivery. So get the drug to where it needs to be without infusing it and subjecting the body to the untoward sequela that that drug presents, which are many. Okay, so, so you wouldn't give this to a patient in an IV form, but certainly you could give it to them um, in a um, nasal spray or nasal irrigation form. This is where we sit in our hospice and palliative care world. Drugs are developed for patients that fit maybe within one or two standard deviations of the mean. Um, it's just pure numbers. They, they have to treat tens of millions of patients in order to keep those factories running. Your patients don't fall within one or two standard deviations of the mean. They're on the wings, on the outside. So we, that's why we need to be so creative. If, if it was easy to treat our patients, then we wouldn't have jobs. <laughs> they would, uh, they'd be treated by their family practitioners, right? But it's because of the difficulty in treating our patients and how their, uh, their um, needs are so unique that we have to be really creative in what we do. Oh, you can hit the arrows. Okay, hit the arrows too. Yeah. All right. All right. So how can we get drugs into the body? Of course, oral is probably the most common one. Um, nasal, sublingual, rectal, vaginal, inhalation, transdermal injectable, including um, IV, IM, sub-Q, and intradermal. We can apply it to the eyeball, um, and it will be absorbed that way sometimes, uh, and urethral. So our oral dosage forms, uh, of course, we have capsules and liquids. Um, I can't see, I think it just says compounding dosage form. Um, we have transdermal lollipops and popsicles, rapid dissolve tablets, um, Troki, uh, how long has it been since you've learned about first pass metabolism? That's cool. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, yeah. So, what do you know about first pass metabolism? You direct um, uh, modification in the liver before it actually hits systemic. Correct. Thirty-five percent of the blood flow from the gut goes to the liver through the portal circulation, right? 30, 35%. So um, potentially, if your drug is heavily hepatically metabolized, you're going to lose 35% of your drug before it even gets into the bloodstream. That's the advantage of sublingual dosage forms. Um, here, here's an example of sublingual dosage forms. If you want to take one, these, everything I have here is placebo. But um, you just dissolve those under the tongue. And of course, you're going to swallow some, so you're going to get some of that first pass metabolism. But the idea is that most of it, when you hold it under the tongue or between the cheek and gum, is going to be absorbed through the buccal mucosa. So you're going to absorb the first, first pass metabolism. And you also get a quicker onset. So um, if you have patients that aren't, um, if you have patients that aren't being treated well with oral medications, you can always consider changing them to a sublingual dosage form. We also have suppositories, enemas, rectal rockets. Um, this is a rectal rocket. I'll pass it around the room. There's a slit in the rectal rocket. I think we discussed this later, um, but there's, we, there's a slit in the rectal rocket. Any, anyone guess what that's for? It where you put the medication? No, no, the, the, the medication is actually in the rocket itself. But so the it's rocket a, is comprised of the medication. Correct. Oh, I see. Yes. It's a gelatinous rocket there. Kind of a more paraffin. Suppositories usually melt within 
oh, 15 minutes or so. They're designed to melt quickly. The Rectal Rocket is it has a higher paraffin wax concentration, so it, it melts within about eight to 10 hours. So we have someone uh, who, who just texted in gas. That's exactly what it's yeah. for, yeah. Um, so when you use the rocket, I'm just gonna pull it up to, to my camera here. So okay, uh, so people can see there's the slit in it, slit down the side. So there you go. Okay. Um, so this part stays internal, uh, this part stays external, and that stays the anus. So if the patient has, um, uh, this will sit in place for eight to 10 hours, and then it will finally melt through. Um, but it will bathe the tissue for the full eight to 10 hours, where a suppository will give you about four hours at best. Um, John, you have, a, you have a story about rectal rockets? Yeah, I had, uh, uh, this goes back uh, a number of years, and I was, uh, the, the, the genesis of the referral is actually interesting because I was in court uh, uh, for adult practice protective services uh, case on a hospice patient. And so I was testifying and the judge was very interested in the sort of what we were doing and specifically what my role was. I thought it was somewhat critical, but about two hours after the case concluded, I got a call from the judge. And he said, could you come and see my mother? She has heart failure and she seems miserable and she doesn't get out of the bed, doesn't get out of the house. And I said, sure, I would, I would, uh, I would be happy to do that. So I went up to see her. And the issue wasn't so much her heart failure, which was problematic, but the fact that for 25 years, she'd been living with severe rectal pain. And that was limiting her mobility or inability to get out. And she'd been to Mayo Clinic and been to uh, GI folks and GI surgeons and and so we, uh, uh, we, 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 we put together a rectal rocket. They've helped to compound that with, uh, with uh, I don't know if it was lidocaine or prolocaine or. I think it was lidocaine and ketamine. And uh, for sure, ketamine uh, was, was the main component in that. And tried that out, and it, re it, it resolved her pain. And so um, it just was a, a, that wasn't the first time I'd used a rectal rocket, but was, was a really notable um, uh, positive result from using that. And you can take somebody from not being able to, to get up or sit down or move the house to, right. you know, to having a normal quality of life. That's huge. Yeah. And and in case you didn't hear that slit when you insert it, it's to prevent it from becoming a real rocket if somebody <laughs> yes, right. somebody has gas. Okay. Why is that not available for a hemorrhoid treatment? It, it is. Like oh, yeah. absolutely <laughs> is. Yeah, one to two, one to two suppositor or one to two rockets is usually enough to treat most cases of hemorrhoids. So we use hydrocortisone and lidocaine for that combination. Pretty cool. Um, we have nasal sprays um, and ear preparations, uh, topical creams, ointments, gels, oral adhesives, um, mucolox bandages, which we'll go over in a second. And um, uh, some compounding pharmacies make sterile products. Mine does not. So this is a mucolox bandage. Um, I would like to volunteer. Maya. <laughs> Saw the look. When I have my intern, I can do it. Okay. Have you used the mucolox bandage before? Not. <laughs> okay. So what the mucolox bandage is, it's pretty cool. Um, it's for sores and it contains some polymers that when it comes in contact with water, it will become a gel. So we incorporate the medicine in the powders and my just pull out your bottom lip. Okay, and go ahead and you put your lip back and maybe just touch oh. it with your tongue. Tell everybody what you what you feel. Disgusting, but no, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. What do you feel? Be more descriptive. It's not powder at this point. It's kind of like really jelly like. It's a gel, mm -hmm. and it's sticking there. Very much so. Yeah. So if you quit working it with your tongue, it will stay there for about six hours. Oh, geez. Yes. <laughs> Why did you do this to me? <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a rite of passage. All right. Okay. Okay. Um, so if somebody has mouth, uh, mouth ulcers or e even any kind of wounds, this is a great bandage for that because you just apply it and it sticks there. Um, so if we have a normal spray uh, that we would apply to a wound, that's going to be gone in about 15 minutes to an hour because the, the blood flow is gonna take it away. That gel, the blood flow can't take away. And as the drug diffuses out of the mucolox bandage, 
um, it, 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 it continues to pay out the drug um, through that six to eight hours. So even if she rubs it like Maya right now, when you have I'm a foreign, it anymore. <laughs> when you have a foreign body in your mouth, the, the tendency is to really work it right. But even if you rub it, it's going to stay in place. Um, what do we use in this? We use antihistamines, anesthetics, antivirals, antifungals, um, anesthetic. So uh, you kill the pain. Of course, that'll make the whole mouth go numb. But um, when somebody has severe aphthous ulcers or something, it, it could be a great way to treat them. Uh, you don't have to touch the wound with it. You can just puff it into the wound. Um, and it really is advantageous for an oozing wound because it will help to soak up some of that oozing too. Suppositories we talked about. Um, so let's go through what we can use suppositories for. Uh, we can usually, you, you can either use them rectally or vaginally. Um, patients difficulty swallowing. Does the rectal blood flow uh, go through the portal circulation to the liver? First pass. Who thinks yes? Who thinks no? Okay, the no's have it. Yeah, that, that's true. So um, it, it prevents the uh, much of the first pass metabolism for a lot of our drugs uh, if we use suppositories. Um, we have to be careful though when we're looking at rectal or vaginal use. Um, John and I had a hospice patient about 15 years ago, and we decided to use 10% um, ketamine for her. She had vaginal cancer. Uh, we used 10% ketamine, and the absorption through the vaginal mucosa was so great that she ended up getting dissociative effects. Um, so I called Dr. Mulder. I said, can we decrease this to 2%? He said, yeah, sure. And so it worked well for her, and she was happy with that. Um, so we just uh, helped her out with that. But we have to be careful because it is it is more readily absorbed. If somebody has difficulty swallowing or if they're nauseated, nauseated or vomiting, uh, they obviously can't take oral meds. So uh, suppositories become uh, a, a, a fair option. Uh, suppositories aren't used very much in the U.S., but they're used a lot more frequently in Europe. Um, we can either have a local effect or a systemic effect. So treat hemorrhoids, um, irritable bowel syndrome, et cetera. So what does rectal delivery look like? Uh, this is a chart that shows the rectal bioavailability of drugs. So for example, morphine is 31 to 72% absorbed. Um, hydromorphone is 36%. Methadone is 67 to 91% absorbed, et cetera. So we do have good references that we can approximate an oral dose. So we can approximate the availability and the absorption um, and come up with a pretty close dose to what you need. So as your patients become uh, more frail towards the end of life and maybe they, they're starting to go non-oral, um, and if you can't control them well with IV medications, consider um, rectal absorption. Um, paracetamol, that's um, um, acetaminophen, 91%. Um, ketoprofen is about 100% absorbed. Uh, ketoprofen is really good for a chronic headache patient. So 75 milligram suppository for a, a headache patient is uh, good. When you use rectal, um, I mean, some of the challenge with uh, with the non-steroidals are, you know, the kidney and the elderly, but also the GI. Uh, does that eliminate the GI side effects? No. Um, th that's a great question. So I, 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 did a, I did a significant literature search about 10 years ago because I wanted to show that topical NSAIDs, rectal NSAIDs, et cetera, avoided the GI effects. They avoided the cardiac effects. They avoided the uh, the renal effects. Couldn't find anything. And and the FDA still requires a black box warning on um, like Voltaren gel, for example, mm -hmm. for cardiac and renal effects. So um, there's no reason to believe that these are stronger than the um, the um, the 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 gastric effects are more a systemic effect than a direct act. Got it. Yeah, uh, because the 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 gastric mucosa is protected by prostaglandins. Mm -hmm. So if we cut those down, then uh, they're gone everywhere. Uh, rectal morphine sulfate. Um, this is a study that shows uh, the absorption of rectal morphine sulfate at different pH levels, and the takeaway is the more ionized the morphine is, uh, because the farther away from the PKA we are, I don't expect you guys to understand this, but uh, this is the area in which I live. 
um, the, the worse the absorption. So if we can have uh, morphine that's closer to its unionized form, we can get a fair amount of absorption. We could get plasma concentrations that are therapeutic. And you see they, they peak in about a half hour and they last for about two to three hours uh, in the therapeutic range. So um, that, that could be a good option for some patients. There was a product on the market up to about 10 years ago called RMS, RMS, RMS rectal morphine sulfate. It was an actual uh, 10 milligram morphine um, suppository, but that's not on the market anymore. Uh, nasal spray. So we talked about using nasal sprays. This can either be used for a topical effect, like we talked about with the aspergillus, or it can be used for the systemic effect. So if you have a patient who can't be treated, and maybe the only way to treat them is with a uh, fentanyl nasal spray, um, then nasal sprays are certain, certainly a way to do that. Um, there is a there was a fentanyl nasal spray. I don't know if it's on the market anymore. Do you remember what that was called? Um, I don't remember the brand name of it. Yeah, uh, Subsys. I think it was Subsys. Um, but that was about three hundred dollars a dose. Um, so you're not going to do that with your hospice patients, but um, consider nasal sprays if you can't treat them other ways. Um, this shows the uh, the uh, uh, absorption of morphine. The black boxes are IV morphine, and this is a little bit misleading because it's a logarithmic scale uh, versus nasal morphine, um, both in solution and in a powder. And you can see we do get um, we do get significant drug absorption. Not quite as much as IV, but we'd never expect to get as much as IV uh, because IV absorption is 100%. But we do get absorption uh, using IV nasal morphine. Um, combination therapies for improved compliance. A while ago, uh, we were using a lot of inhaled morphine and Decrodon for respiratory distress. John, do you still use that? Well, I like it. You know, the, the, the studies, uh, and this is the caveat that the nebulized morphine really has not been shown in the studies to be effective. Um, I, I'm critical of the study design because they really didn't study our population. And they use different methodologies in terms of determining whether they're effective or not. And uh, patient perception uh, is not one of those. It, it really has to do with pulmonary function testing before and after morphine administration uh, on a treadmill. And uh, so... Uh, but I have found it to be effective, uh, usually in combination with dexamethasone, um, and I like that combination. So I, you know, again, in, in, in previous lectures, we've commented about the fact that our specialty, uh, you know, is one where people are looking to us for last, you know, last ditch efforts. When when the when evidence basis has failed, um, is there a rational basis for why this should work? Absolutely. Uh, we understand the impact of morphine and uh, steroids, for that matter, on the uh, on the bronchial tree, um, and so there's a rational basis on why it might work. Anecdotally, we've seen it; uh, we've seen good response to that. Um, so, uh, so that's a long answer. Yes, I still use it. I find it of value, um, but uh, but people are critical of me for that because there's no, in quotes, evidence basis for it. Yeah, and you you bring up a good point. So our patients are. They're at the end of the rope. And um, I had a hospice doctor call me about 10 years ago and, and say, um, I've, I've got this patient on hydromorphone, 16 milligrams every four hours. What's the maximum dose I can use? What's the maximum dose of hydromorphone? Go on. That, that's, ex that's exactly right. Keep going until you, 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 you help the patient's pain, but don't overdo it with the sedation. Or, you get them to the point where they're comfortable. Exactly, you keep going. Um, so I, I had to tell that doctor, there's there's really no upper limit doctor. And he, he was an older guy, so um, he should have known that. But uh, so uh, inhalation solutions, both for um, respiratory distress or infectious disease, so anti inhaled mic antimicrobials. Um, if you have somebody with real thick mucus, that happens sometimes, especially if they get the flu or COVID, um, inhaled acetylcysteine uh, works really well. 
So I don't know if you've ever used that, but consider that, keep that in your hip pocket because when, the, when they can't breathe because that mucus is so thick, um, just the 20 minute treatment of acetylcysteine will break that mucus down and help them get their breath. Inhaled fentanyl, again, uh, the IV dose is the blue circles. Um, the, uh, the diamonds, the pink diamonds are the uh, inhaled dose. And you can see that 200 mil micrograms of inhaled fentanyl is roughly equivalent to a 100 microgram IV dose. Um, so don't discount inhaled drug delivery. Um, just more on the linearity between um, the doses, so 100, 200, 300 milligrams. And again, this is a logarithmic scale. So you can see that the the amount absorbed, the amount delivered does not seem to uh, blunt with the increased amount delivered. Um, we talked about rectal rockets. So what are the causes of neuropathy? Just shout them out. Uh, diabetes is the number one. 60% of patients with diabetes will suffer from neuropathy, um, viral infections, chemo or radiation-induced alcoholism, vitamin deficiency. Well, how, how do you treat neuropathy? What's your number one drug to treat neuropathy? Gabapentin. Gabapentin, of course, right? Um, and when I talk to doctors about gabapentin, I, 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 I ask them how many like it. And not many of them like it. And why don't they like it? because 30% of the people that use it become zombies. We can't get a high enough concentration where we need it at the periphery uh, without affecting the brain in a negative way. So this is a big blow up of the skin and you see the blood vessels, the red and blue blood vessels, but you also see the green nerve cells. The good thing about uh, peripheral neuropathy is that it's usually on the surface of the skin. And if we apply drugs to the surface of the skin, uh, we can let them soak through the skin, through the epidermis, into the dermis, hit those nerves that are misbehaving while sparing the rest of the body from the untoward side effects of the drugs. So how do we treat pain usually? This is, a, the, I call it the pain pyramid. Um, the bottom level is usually over-the-counter things like um, ibuprofen or acetaminophen. Then we go up into the second level, tramadol, um, maybe Tylenol with coating. We don't use a lot of Tylenol with coating. Third level, we're getting into Norco. Fourth level, we're getting into morphine. Fifth level, we're getting into fentanyl, those kind of things. Um, what is the problem with all those drugs except for the bottom tier? They all belong to what class of drugs? Opioids, exactly. Are opioids effective for um, neuropathic pain? Are they the best thing to treat the neuropathic pain? Best thing. Oh. No, exactly. Uh, because there's other receptors, right? Um, a meta-analysis showed that uh, short-term use of opioids had mixed results, uh, were long, intermediate to long-term, only had an average of a 13-point decrease and 100 point uh, VAS. Uh, true story, I had a patient um, who was getting Percocet, combination of acetaminophen and oxycodone. oxycodone. Uh, doctor decided that he didn't want her to have so much acetaminophen, so he just switched her to um, oxycodone 10 milligram tablets. She called me, she said, this stuff doesn't work. So what was the real thing that was working for her? It was the acetaminophen. She didn't need the oxycodone at all. Um, so. When, when, every, when everything, when the only tool that we have in our toolbox is a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. But there's many other things that we can use to treat neurotrophic pain. So let's talk about neurotransmitters. Um, we have neurotransmitters that are excitatory and inhibitory. If it's an excitatory neurotransmitter, we want to blunt that effect. If it's an inhibitory neurotransmitter, we want to mimic that effect. Um, glutamate and aspartic acid are both excitatory um, neurotransmitters, for example, whereas GABA is inhibitory neurotransmitter. Neurotransmitters consist of amino acids, peptides, or monoamines. Um, 
the amino acids, we have glutamate is uh, stimulatory, aspartate is stimulatory, D-serine is stimulatory, um, GABA is inhibitory, and glycine is inhibitory. Uh, NMDA is n methyl d aspartic acid. That's uh, the receptor that the aspartic acid and glutamate works on. Uh, what drugs do we have that block NMDA? Ketamine and methadone. Yep, very good. You're absolutely right. And, and dextromethorphan. About 25 years ago, a study came out that showed that people that use dextromethorphan, delsum, um, were able to decrease their opioid use by 30%. And it took me a while to understand why that was, but then I, I understood that's because it's working on the NMDA receptor, and that's the real thing that's causing their pain. It's not the opioid receptor, the mu receptors. Uh, peptides are mostly inhibitory. Uh, we've identified over 50, and they include your endorphins and enkephalins. Mono means dopamine is inhibitory. Norepi, it depends on the concentration. So at low concentration, norepi and epi are both uh, inhibitory. At higher concentrations, they're stimulatory. Uh, histamine is always stimulatory, and serotonin is inhibitory. Uh, pain modulators, GABA aminobutyric acid, um, that mimics the GABA receptor. It, uh, these, these drugs include things like uh, benzodiazepines and baclofen. Uh, we used to think that neurotin, uh, gabapentin, was, um, had affinity for the GABA receptors, but they really inhibit the calcium channel response. Um, so they mimic a GABA response, but they don't have an affinity for the GABA receptor. Sodium channel blockers. Uh, remember your uh, nerve conduction. It all relies on sodium channel gates in the nerves, and if we can block those sodium channels, we can cause um, a decrease in pain response. So local anesthetic drugs like lidocaine are the most common uh, used. Well, you can also use antiarrhythmic anti drugs, but it's been at least 18 years before I've used it, uh, since I've used an antiarrhythmic drug. And why is that? Because antiarrhythmic drugs can cause arrhythmias. Yeah, yeah. So, so you gotta be really careful with those. So can lidocaine in high concentrations, but it, it's, they're, they're, it's not quite susceptible to cardiac tissue. Um, alpha-2 agonists, alpha-2 agonists inhibit the release of norepi from the presynaptic cleft. Uh, clonidine is your prototypical alpha-2 agonist uh, that we use frequently. And uh, peripheral mu agonists. So you don't just have mu agonists, the opioid receptors in the brain. You have those all throughout the body. Um, they keep a nerve in a polarized state, so if the nerve recover, it can't fire another impulse. And the, the drugs that we have that are uh, mu receptor agonists are morphine, hydromorphone, oxycodone, et cetera. Uh, methadone also affects the mu receptor, but in its levorotatory form. It's the dextrorotatory form. You guys are going back to organic chem now thinking, whoa, I remember that stuff. Uh, it's the dextrorotatory form that... Um, uh, blocks the NMDA receptor. Maya, how's that? How's that um, uh, polyox bandage going? A lot less irritating. But you still feel it, right? I do feel it still. Yeah, it's still there. Yep. Okay. Um, we also forget about the norepi and serotonin reuptake inhibitors, like our tricyclic antidepressants. Somebody with pain is having trouble sleeping. What do we do for them? What's, what does the typical uneducated doctor do for them? They're going to give them what drug? Call them an Ambien. The Ambien. They're going to give them an Ambien 100% of the time. You're absolutely right. Um, but if we have a patient with pain, why not give them a tricyclic antidepressant like amitriptyline, nor nortriptyline, et cetera, uh, where we get the dual effect of the drowsiness as a side effect, and we get the norepi nor and serotonin uh, reuptake modulation, which is going to help their pain. Topical amitriptyline is really, really good for um, uh, treating neuropathic pain too. Beta blockers do this too. Um, I, I sing. I, I used to sing a lot. I sing the national anthem at Griffin's game. So you know, big, big arenas with lots of people, and um, so the heart starts racing. And what do you do for performance anxiety? Propranolol. Propranolol. Propranolol is a great drug. If you have to give a speech and you're nervous, take 10 milligrams of propranolol. It just evens out the ride. But I decided 
I didn't have enough time for it to be absorbed. So I put it on my tongue. I absorbed, like we talked about um, uh, sublingual drug delivery earlier. My tongue went numb like that. <laughs> and so beta blockers are a great uh, a way to treat neuropathic pain too. Uh, my tongue went numb. I was able to perform, but it still was kind of a weird feeling to have a numb tongue while you're trying to sing the national anthem. Right. Yeah. Um, and I, I know for a fact that uh, amitriptyline will, um, uh, will, will numb the nerves too. Uh, early on, I had a a cat was getting amitriptyline because they were misbehaving in the house and they were getting a uh, creamsicle flavor, orange creamsicle flavor. I don't know why a cat would like that, but um, so I tasted it in the early days. I tasted a lot of stuff to see, make sure it was good. I tasted it. My tongue went numb very quickly too. So another testament to amitriptyline will help with um, uh, nerve pain. Anti-inflammatory drugs, ketoprofen is my favorite because it has good transdermal permeability and it has good synovial affinity. So if you have somebody with joint or knee uh, issues, it will it will go in and stick. Uh, steroids, prednisone, methylpred, uh, dexamethasone. Uh, dimethyl sulfoxide is a precursor to MSM. So it has great anti-inflammatory properties and it gets through the skin well. We talked about NMDA, that's stimulatory. Um, we talked about its blockers, which include ketamine, dextromethorphan, and dextrorotatory methadone. Um, so with methadone, you actually get a, a dual action you get the you get the action on the opioid receptors and mu receptors and you also get the nmda receptor uh, action so if you uh have a patient with neuropathic pain and you're thinking about an opioid methadone is the, the one of choice what's the problem with methadone what is its half-life really long it's, it's about 50 hours 50 hours. So think about that. Four days from now, the dose you took today is still accumulating. So you have to really start low and go slow with methadone. Um, and for some reason, or for that, that's the reason it scares a lot of people into not using it, but it's, it's a great drug. Um, you just have to have trustworthy patients. Plasticity. Uh, it's defined as the ability to change and adapt, especially the ability of the central nervous system to acquire alternative pathways for sensory perception or motor skills. A lot of times if we throw one agent at a patient with neuropathic pain or, or that kind of thing, the nerves are going to figure out a way to get around that pain. They're either going to go over the wall, under the wall, or through the wall somehow um, because that nerve has to get the transmission through. So a lot of times we can't treat a patient with one agent. We have to use multiple agents, maybe up to four or five agents to ensure that we hit all the mechanisms so that the pathways don't have a way through. Drug delivery. You're, God designed us to have our skin be a barrier between us and our environment, which is great. Um, it keeps things in you and it keeps things out of you. That's the that's the basic purpose of the skin. Also, a little bit of immunological response and vitamin D production, but barrier to your environment is the big thing. So how do we get drugs through the skin? Um, if we look at, where, where does peripheral neuropathy usually happen? Uh, yeah, not a trick, right? It's in the periphery. So hands and feet. And as people, we're grasping bipeds. So we grab things and we walk. And the, the skin wears down through uh, friction. It doesn't wear down. It actually builds up because of the friction. So we have enough stratum corneum there to, um, uh, uh, to, to keep us from bleeding and breaking through. So if we look at the stratum corneum for the hands and feet uh, on the left side versus the same uh, scale on the scalp, the skin is about 25 times thicker. That presents a great barrier to transdermal drug delivery. So how can we get drugs through these skin where we have most of our neuropathic cases? Hydration is a one way. So the skin on the left is uh, unhydrated skin. The skin on the right is hydrated skin. And those holes and canyons and things you see there, uh, those are really water channels. So if we can create water channels in the skin, the drugs will uh, penetrate better and they'll penetrate through those channels rather than having to go through the anhydrous, very uh, uh, tenacious layers of the stratum corneum that we have on the left. So I always tell people um, at least one time a day, try to soak their skin, uh, warm water, cool water, it doesn't matter. 
just soak your skin till it starts to get pruney. And then that seems to be uh, very helpful with transdermal drug delivery. We can also use liposomes. Liposomes, uh, when we incorporate the drug in the middle of the liposome, um, the liposome, the phospholipids in the liposome will actually um, integrate with the skin, the, the, the lipids in the skin, and kind of force that through, and that will keep doing that. So liposomes are another way that we use to enhance drug delivery, and we use a lot of liposomal um, drug delivery uh, in compounding pharmacy. So this just kind of shows on how the liposomes will uh, interact with the, the layers and kind of release the, um, the drugs that are inside the liposomes into the skin. And we do have evidence that these drugs are actually delivered through the skin. So ketamine, um, this, these are in vitro uh, drug delivery studies, but 44.8% of the ketamine got through the skin, uh, clonidine 21.28%, um, gabapentin about 4%. But if you think about it, what's your maximum dose of gabapentin? About 3,200 milligrams a day, right? Um, that's your oral dose. If you apply 100 milligrams directly to the skin, and let's say 10 milligrams of that uh, gets through the skin, or, or the 3.94, so you're getting um, about, three point, about 4 milligrams of gabapentin directed at those nerves, but they're specifically directed at those nerves that are misbehaving. They're not being diluted in the volume of distribution of the rest of the body. Um, so even though it's only 4%, it's adequate to treat those, those nerve cells on the surface of the skin. You know, off, off the top of your head, what percentage of that oral dose actually makes it to the periphery? Yes, um, gabapentin has a very high bioavailability. Uh, oral, 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 oral bioavailability. Mm -hmm. Oh, you, you're talking about here? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So if, if, if you're taking, because you're saying, you know, four, four milligrams is, is adequate to, um, right. uh, to, to if, if you can deliver that drug to the nerve, but of that, uh, you know, of that, you know, 800 milligram tablet that someone is taking, uh, how much of that actually gets per periphery because you have to dose it high oh, oh, because of the absorption issue. Yes, correct. Well, it's, it's not because of the absorption issue. It's because of the volume of distribution issue. Um, because you're getting the same concentration in the brain and the nose and the fingers and the uh, the gut and the feet and the legs. And so that drugs, the, uh, uh, um, the um, patent is, is, is very readily absorbed between 90 and hundred percent. So you're getting all the 800 milligrams somewhere. I don't know how much you're getting into the periphery. Yeah. I don't know how it distributes into the periphery. That's all right. Yeah. Yeah. But somebody says, I, I can't take gabapentin because it makes me drowsy. Well, looking at this example, they're going to get four milligrams into the bloodstream. Is that significant for the patient? Absolutely not. Dermatomes are another um, way that we can treat pain, and I've had really good success with this. Uh, people with peripheral neuropathy at, at the feet um, typically will have uh, pain that intersects at the L4, L5 dermatomes. In fact, if you have somebody with neuro neuropathic pain, start thinking dermatomes. And a lot of times I'll ask the patient, when did you hurt your back? How did you know? Because you have pain that's radiating down the outside of your um, quads, through the knee, down into your foot. So you injured your L4 region. And, and they're amazed that I know that. But it's right there on the map. Um, and so when it, if, if you give them a cream and you tell them, let's say they have the, 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 the neuropathic pain on the outside of the thigh, um, is that going to do any good for them? No, because the pain's originating in the back. So it, sometimes if we take a high concentration of ketamine, gabapentin, and we apply that over the dorsal horn at the L4, L5 region, we can intercept that pain or calm down the pain where it's actually originating at the nerve. Um, I use the example of... Um, of a heart attack patient, right? Uh, they have that shooting pain down their arm. You could cut off the arm and the pain's still gonna be there because the brain's interpreting that pain as coming from the arm where it's really not originating there. Um, it's the same thing with, um, with these pains. So if, if you have patients that have diffuse neuropathic pain down their leg, um, consider the dermatomes as being responsible for that. Uh, how effective is, um, are these topical therapies for neuropathic pain? 
Uh, amitriptyline, 2%, ketamine, 1%, frankly, very low concentrations. 28% um, with refractory, moderate to severe neuropathic pain enrolled. 21% completed the trial. Um, bottom line, five subjects completed. Um, that should be greater than a 51, greater than a 50% reduction. And one received 100% reduction in pain. 34% um, reduction in overall pain at six months. And again, the concentrations we used were very low here. Uh, typically, we'll use amitriptyline in about 7%, ketamine in 5 to 10%. Um, another study, 11 to 23 patients with central post-stroke pain achieved 40% reduction after receiving 25 milligrams of IV ketamine. Um, we could do that nasally. Um, IV ketamine is 100% absorbed. Nasal ketamine is 50% absorbed. Um, a second observation showed, demonstrated a 50% reduction in pain. Um, intranasal use of ketamine for, um, oh, for neuropathic pain, a significant reduction in post uh, neuropathic pain. Is dose pending lasting two to three hours with maximum pain reduction 34 per minute, uh, of 30 to 40% at 50 minutes after application. So we don't have any consensus on optimal dosing of ketamine, um, but doses range anywhere from 50 milligrams to 1,000 milligrams. John, do you have any um, do you have any thoughts on kind of dosing of ketamine? Um, I have used everything in that range from 45 to 1,000. Yeah, um, it really is limited by uh, by side effects. And if someone is uh, receiving benefit or progressive benefit as you titrate the dose without any psychomatic effects, uh, then um, then you keep pushing it. But uh, a good way to titrate the dose is to give them a ketamine solution at 100 milligrams per milliliter, um, and have them start with 0.1 milliliter. So that's 10 milligrams of ketamine, um, and then they can go up every day or so a little bit until they either reach the dissociative effects or they achieve pain uh, relief. And then once they do that, ketamine tastes horrible. It's a very bitter drug. So once we establish their dose, then we can make them capsules um, that is gonna help them. More studies showed meaningful relief. Um, gabapentin, 51% uh, of women, or 51 women with vulvodynia, 80% uh, scored at least a 50% improvement of pain using topical uh, gabapentin for vulvodynia. Uh, zero stomia, uh, a lot of your patients might have had head or, head or, head or neck cancer um, and it kind of shut off their salivary glands. We know that the uh, glossopharyngeal glands are the ninth cranial nerve. And anybody take a guess on what the neurotransmitter is that um, innervates those? Maya? It's acetylcholine. Um, so if we have a procholinergic drug, our, our prototypical procholinergic drug is pyrocarpine, um, will stimulate um, salivary production. What's our pro prototypical anticholinergic drug? Anticholinergic. Yeah. No, well, yeah, no, diphenhydramine has anticholinergic properties, but that's a side effect. That's not what it, the molecule is designed to do. Atropine? Okay. Atropine, right? Atropine is your prototypical anticholinergic drug. So if you have somebody towards the end of life that has excess secretions, what are you going to do for them? Atropine eye, atropine eye drops right underneath the tongue, and that that will help the, the that will help to calm down the secretion. If you have somebody that's had damage to those nerves um, because of radiation, then you want to use a procholinergic agent um, like pilocarpine. And here's a study that just showed um, some patients who received pilocarpine lozenges um, that had had neck cancer. Um, the results. It's interesting that. The placebo results were greater than the salogen. Uh, salogen is a commercially available five milligram tablet, um, and patients got more benefit and improvement of sensation of dryness 
off the uh, placebo. But then when we started looking at pyrocarpine lozenges, and these would be similar to the trochies I passed around earlier. Um, we just incorporated pyrocarpine in there and the patients would suck on them. Um, we, we got almost a 70% uh, improvement in oral dryness, 60% uh, improvement in sensation of sore mouth, and a 60% improvement in speaking. So that is what I have for you this morning. I think the bottom line is you're going to run across patients that are very difficult to treat. And my phone line is always open. Um, or if you move out of state, get to know your compounding pharmacist because we are problem solvers. That's what we do. Um, we, we help patients figure out ways around their medication difficulty. We help doctors treat their patients. So, um, yeah. Um, so if you have questions, call me or call your compounding pharmacist and we'll help you with it. We will help you get through your challenges. Do you have any questions at all? Yes. One medication I was wondering about is your experience with capsaicin because I've seen it topically for like cyclic vomiting. Yeah. I also heard something about a high concentration for uh, a neuropathic pain. You yeah. An hour and they, they yeah. created a high concentration capsaicin patch. And honestly, I don't have much much um, experience with it. So the, the way it works is it burns substance, it burns out substance P. Okay, eventually the nerves just say, I can't deal with it anymore, and it just burns it out. But how do you get to that point? Um, my, when, whenever I put um, capsaicin in a cream for my patients, they call back and say, I can't stand it, it just burns so much. So it's easy for me to say, suck it up, buttercup, and just deal with it. Eventually you'll get better but that's a very inhumane thing to do for your patients. So um, I really struggle with capsaicin over the years. Uh, I think it's simple, but how do we get patients to the point where it actually works? What are your thoughts on capsaicin? I mean, just for the um, sickly vomiting piece of it, if you actually have someone with cannabis hyperemesis, I've had some success with. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, they just give it to them and they rub it on their upper abdomen occasionally. I don't have... I have an N of like three that it's that is worked on, but it's an interesting thing that seems to be relatively benign that they can handle that. It's like that the theory of the hot shower, like that's what helps them feel better. So if you can give them that the cream. But I was interested in the higher concentration patches that you put on for an hour if they can actually tolerate that, like a post herpetic neuralgia kind of thing. I don't have any experience with the patches. Yeah. What about expense of some of these medications? Do you see people running into the the expense just of all these yeah all these oh, oh compounded medications we're we're usually looking at about two to three dollars a day for therapy um yeah so insurances cover about 20 percent of them um they're not real friendly about covering them um but yeah about 20 about percent yeah but you know, patients have no problem going out and spending five bucks on a Starbucks every morning. Right. That's right. Um, but then when you tell them they've got to spend three dollars on medication, then they flip out because the insurance companies have lulled them into the feeling that medication should be cheap or free. Right. Right. I had a question just about like logistics of like say we're working in a hospital and we'd like to try a compounded topical or something like that. What What's the best way to go about? It depends on the hospital. Yeah. Okay. Um, Metro University of Health is really easy. They call us up, send it to us. We get it to them. Um, Spectrum Corwell, you have to jump through a lot more hoops. Um, and St. Mary's is kind of in between. So it just depends on the hospital. Yeah. Um, some patients can bring in their own medicines into the hospital, so you can call it in. Um, family member can pick it up and take it to the hospital. Yeah. And, and I, I just would, would, would uh, just kind of reinforce that. I think that a couple of things that the, the huge takeaways here is that if you've got a patient with a challenging issue that you're that you're struggling with, call Dave. Mm -hmm. He really will uh, help to go through uh, some options and alternatives. Uh, and that uh, it's sometimes valuable to go directly to the hospital pharmacist and saying, this is what I need. How can I make this happen? Um, and some cases, they will work to make it happen. But in other cases, as Dave said, it's a, you know, meds from home sort of a thing where we can get that through the local pharmacy and bring it in and it can be administered. It's just that, that the hospital pharmacies may not have the capabilities of doing the same level of compounding that a community pharmacy does. And I don't know what Corwell's policy is today, 
Um, but not too many years ago, they would only they've limited it to one percent ketamine topical cream, um, which just isn't enough, in my opinion, for most patients. Yeah, I don't know, Gretchen or someone else from Coral, has that changed at all, or is that still uh, still the limit that they're doing there? There we go. Unmute. It's currently the same one percent. Uh, I, I will. I will mention, however, that uh, up until this 2008, it was not available at all, and we were able to get the compounded ketamine at least on the formulary. Uh, so it is available at that level, um, for better or for worse. Other questions? Hi, everyone. I, go ahead, I had Gary. a question, if you guys can hear me all right. Sure, sure, Gary, go ahead. I'm working mostly in the palliative oncology clinic here at Spectrum, and one of the most burdensome symptoms I've been noticing with some of our head and neck cancer patients, specifically those that have undergone chemo and radiation to that region, is after we treat their pain and after their pain ultimately resolves, they're dealing with these very thick uh, posterior pharynx secretions. And we do all the things, whether it be mucinex, I've tried other things, whether it be uh, atrovent spray to dry secretions, atropine drops, a lot of these uh, saline mixes, et cetera. And I was meaning to ask you, Dave, if you had any idea for compounding methods or more localized treatments to deal with these very thick secretions in this location. Yeah, um, I, I like the idea of pyrocarpine to increase the amount of secretions, so um, it will just dilute it down. And I also like the idea of acetylcysteine um, nebulized solution to help thin that out, because um, that will get and actually break the sulfide bonds in the mucus to help thin that mucus out. Um, so it's more easily removed by just swallowing water. And and you use those just as a standard nebulized? Nebula, yeah, 10 to 20% acetylcysteine. Okay. You know, do that uh, for 20 minutes, three to four times a day. Um, start there and see where that takes you. If it doesn't work, give me a call. Great. Thanks, Dave. Other uh, comments or questions uh, for David while we have him on the line here? Dave, I just wanted to follow up on that um, acetylcysteine. Um, often I'm using, excuse me, 3% nebulized saline for my patients because it's a little more tolerable to them. Yep. Have you noticed any difference between the 3% and the acetylcysteine? Was, does one seem to be more effective for you? No, I think they probably have equal efficacy. I mean, it's, it's, they're different mechanisms of action. So the, the hypertonic saline just brings in water uh, through osmosis. Um, I, I, I don't like the sodium load. Uh, I, I just go with this. I have personal experience with acetylcysteine. I may have the flu, but so bad one year I couldn't breathe. I, li I literally couldn't breathe. And so my personal experience probably colors my, um, therapeutic choices for people. So I, I don't have any comparisons. Um, but if, if they both work great, if somebody can handle the sodium load. Good. No, that's helpful. Thanks a lot. We are at the bottom of the hour, and I think we'll go ahead and uh, transition now to our case presentation. Uh, thanks for those that have been on. David, thank you so much. I know thank you, you have to take leave, yes. but uh, appreciate your being here.